The Great Peshtigo Fire was one of my earliest episodes, made all the way back in March of 2017. Heck, I wasn't even wearing the bow tie yet. And while I'm proud of the episode, which I filmed really when I was just figuring YouTube out, I made a mistake and pronounced the name Peshtigo differently than the way that the locals pronounce it, and I've always wanted to fix that. And so today, on the 150th anniversary of the Great Peshtigo Fire, I'm re-releasing this updated version. Enjoy. You've probably heard of the Great Chicago Fire, a fire so terrible that it burned 3.3 square miles of Chicago that caused some $220 million in damage, killed more than 300 people and left more than 100,000 people homeless. All started, according to a famous legend that's really never been proven, by Mrs. O'Leary's cow. In fact, you might have heard so much about the Great Fire of Chicago that you might think that it was the worst, deadliest fire in American history. And you might be surprised to find out that not only was it not the deadliest fire in American history, it wasn't even the deadliest fire in the American Midwest on that day. The Great Chicago Fire was such big news that it overshadowed news of a fire in a small Wisconsin town called Peshtigo, just some 250 miles away, that occurred on the same day, October 8th, 1871. And so today we will remember the victims of the Great Peshtigo Fire, the deadliest fire in American history. Settlement in the area began in the 1830s with the first sawmill built in the town in 1836. Originally the town was called Clarksville, but in 1858 it was renamed Peshtigo for the nearby Peshtigo River, a tributary of Green Bay. The great wealth of the area is in lumber. The area was heavily forested with white pine, and white pine is great for lumber. White pines can grow 120 to 170 feet tall, or six or more feet around, and they're very straight. They don't have branches for the first three quarters of the tree, and the wood when cut is unpocked. And one white pine can produce enough lumber to build a good-sized house. And when cut, white pine floats easily, which is where the Peshtigo River comes in, because the lumberjack could just haul the trees to the river, and then float them downriver to the lumber mills in the city of Peshtigo. The town had a rich benefactor, William Butler Ogden. Ogden had made a fortune in railroads, and had been the very first mayor of the city of Chicago. And he recognized the value of the trees around Peshtigo and decided to invest there, creating the Peshtigo Company. He built a lumber mill, and he also built the Ogden Woodware Company, a factory that built every sort of wooden implement from axe handles to clothespins. It was the largest factory of its kind in the country. In 1871, Peshtigo was a booming town. It had all the things that you would have in a lumber boom town, from schools to brothels, from churches to banks. It had a population of 1,700, a good sized metropolis for its day. Fire was always a risk in a lumber town, but in the great northern forest it was usually quite wet, and so forest fires would burn themselves out quickly. But this was not a normal year. The forest of Wisconsin and the upper peninsula of Michigan had faced a great drought in 1871. Winters there would usually produce four or five feet of snow, but the winter of 1870-71 had produced hardly any. The normal spring rain showers had been brief, and there hadn't been a good soaking rain since mid-July, with the exception of just one shower in September. On October 8th, Peshtigo had not seen rain for 11 weeks. The forest floor was covered with the tender dry needles dropped by stressed trees, and there was a lot of brush from the lumber work and from clearing land for the railroads. No one knows what started the fire, but fire was commonly used to clear land for farming, or to clear brush for logging, or to cook, or to stay warm. Fires were used everywhere, and fires were commonly left unattended. On October 8th, a cold front was coming down from Canada, ran into a warm front that came up from the southern United States. The difference in temperatures was as much as 40 degrees, and the two crashing together created hurricane-force winds. The town of Peshtigo was built almost entirely out of wood, including the bridge that connected the two parts of the town that were on either side of the Peshtigo River. The Green Bay Weekly Gazette reported, The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the appalling overthrow of Pompeii are the only parallels that history affords of so frightful a calamity. The fire did not reach the town by gradual approaches across the surface of the earth, but seemed to come from above the black pall of smoke that enveloped the place. Nor did the frightful rain of fire strike them from any one direction. All parts of the forest-bound town were assaulted at once, and the terrified populace found themselves without refuge, exposed to all its terrors, whichever way they turned. A survivor, Mr. G.T. Tisdale, said, When the fire struck the town, it seemed to swallow up and literally drown everything. The fire came on swifter than a racehorse, and within 20 minutes of the time it struck the outskirts of the town, everything was in flame. 
pushed by 100 miles per hour winds, the fire created something called a firestorm. Fire so hot that it creates its own wind system. Described as nature's nuclear bomb, it could burn as hot as 2,000 degrees. Something called a convection column rose up and created what was described as a fire tornado. The Green Bay Advocate wrote, The southeasterly gale of Sunday evening reached the proportions of a hurricane there. The woods, which had been alive with slowly running fires for weeks, were suddenly burned with a whirlwind of fire. People rushed to the bridge, hoping that the fire would stop at the Peshtigo River, but it jumped over the river and burnt both sides of the town, and then it burned the bridge, covered with people. Many tried to escape by jumping into the frigid waters of the Peshtigo River, but the fire was burning so hot that you had to be underwater or you would be burned. Tisdale said, I ran into the water, prostrated myself, and put my face in the water, and threw water over my neck and head. The heat was so that I could not keep my head out of the water but for a few seconds at a time, for a space of nearly an hour. Many of those who made it to the river drowned. Others, ironically, died of hypothermia in the 40 degree water. Tilsdale said, I heard men, women, and children crying for help, but was utterly powerless to help anyone. Only a few who made it to the river and some who made it to a lower lying marsh area on the south end of the town survived. In the morning, they found some 1,100 bodies, many more presumed to be dead. The advocate wrote, one family consisting of father, mother, and three children were found dead together within 30 feet of the river. Estimates of death in the fire range as high as 2,500, but it's impossible to tell because the records in towns like Peshtigo and Brussels and a dozen other small towns that were destroyed in the fire were all destroyed, and so no one really knows how many died, many times the number that died in the fire in Chicago. Many of the bodies were burned beyond recognition. Sometimes the only way you could tell that it was human remains at all was because there were the melted remnants of a belt buckle or a wedding ring. Some people were presumably burnt to ash and simply blew away. So others were overcome by poisonous gas or suffocated by the heat of the fire, and the bodies were found apparently untouched by fire. Tilsdale said whole families, heads of families, children, mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters were burned, and remnants of families were running hither and thither, wildly calling and looking for their relatives after the fire. 350 were buried in a mass grave, unidentifiable, some simply because every person on earth who could identify them also perished in the fire. As to the property, the Green Bay Weekly Gazette wrote that the fire made such a clean sweep of the village and farming region of this faded town that a complete detailed statement of the losses would fill a volume. Every building in the town of Peshtigo was gone. The advocate noted, within three hours of the time the fire struck the town, the site of Peshtigo was literally a sand desert, dotted over with smoking ruins. Not a hen coop, or even a dry goods box, was left. The fire burned some 1.2 million acres of Wisconsin and across the border into the Michigan Upper Peninsula before it burned itself out. The survivors did get help from nearby communities in the state of Wisconsin, but since Peshtigo was some two days from the nearest telegraph, the news only slowly eked out and was overshadowed by the news. The Great Chicago Fire, a fire with far fewer casualties, but more witnesses. The town of Peshtigo still survives, was rebuilt, and had about 3,500 residents as of the 2010 census. There is a museum there, just off of US Highway 41, that remembers the victims of the fire and keeps some artifacts. Each year the museum closes for the season on October 8th, the anniversary of the fire. While the fire is relatively unknown elsewhere, it is well remembered in the community where it occurred. The mass grave of the 350 unidentified victims of the fire is adjacent to the museum. Numerous fires also occurred the same day across Michigan, collectively known as the Great Michigan Fire, killing an unknown number of people. Fires across Lake Huron from Peshtigo burned numerous towns like White Rock and Port Huron. There are some theories for why these fires occurred on the same day, including lightning from the storm and even a suggestion that they might have been caused by debris from a comet, but the most likely explanation is simply that the combination of drought, high winds, and carelessness with fire used for clearing land were the common cause. It's not easy to divine some profound lesson from the Great Peshtigo Fire, except maybe people who history forgot deserve to be remembered. Certainly we've gotten better at fighting fires and preventing fires and disaster relief, but disasters still happen and people still die. The people who lived in Peshtigo lived on the fringe of civilization and they knew that offered some risk and maybe that risk seemed small. The people who took on the dangerous profession of cutting and milling lumber worked so risky that people died every day. But it's, it's not like these people were fools. It's not even like they were unprepared. It's just that all the conditions for a disaster just came terribly together 
in one day. And maybe that's the biggest lesson that can be divined, that, that you can't take anything in life for granted. That the world can change in one terrible instant. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.